Hi guys, uh, this is my second part of, um, why is it not showing anything? I'm sorry, having a little bit of problems, give me a second. Okay, hi, alright, so everything looks okay. <laughs> uh, welcome to my second video, uh, which is the Hick Hitchhiker's Guide to Fly Tying. Uh, part two, uh, which is going to focus on uh, your uh, choice of vices, uh, your workstation or workspace, uh, hooks, and uh, why going barbless is the way to go. Uh, so um, this is all going to be uh, under my company, Fisher Flyworks. If you guys are interested in looking at my shop, which I didn't mention in my last video, uh, it is uh, through Etsy at etsy.com slash shop slash Fisher Flyworks. Um, you could find uh, everything that I am selling on that website. I also have a Fisher Flyworks Facebook page, um, which I move this video over to as well. All right, so I guess we're back on. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. Where was I? Um, so, yeah, so I have a, a Facebook page as well for Fisher Flyworks that I moved this over to, uh, and that also is directly linked to uh, my shop. Uh, so feel free to check those out. Um, and if you want to follow um, my videos, there's a little icon on your top right, um, part of your phone with the three dots. If you click into that, um, I think there's like a selection for notifications from, uh, the videos and stuff like that, that you could subscribe to. Um, I'm not really good with that stuff. So, uh, give it your best shot. I think that's where it's under. Um, so my, uh, so on the agenda for tonight, the thing that I wanted to, Hello, hello. Uh, the thing that I wanted to go over first was uh, choice of fly tying vices. Uh, there's a lot of vices out there. Um, and they're all different. They all are built uh, differently. They all do the same thing. They hold a hook. Uh, some hold hooks better than others. Uh, that's, the, that's the really primary... Uh, advantage and disadvantage to um, vices. Your your primary goal when you're getting a vice is to make sure that the hook is stable uh, and that you're not um, having any sort of hook slipping uh, when you're tying. Because as you're as you're wrapping your thread around the hook and it's and it's causing the hook to you know slightly move. Uh, when I say slip, the hook the hook will sit like this, and you'll start to see it. Um, droop, uh, and that's a real pain in the ass. Uh, you don't need that. You don't need to have another problem on top of all the other problems that will ensue naturally with uh, fly tying. So if your hook is not stable and staying in place, you are going to get frustrated really quickly. And um, it this is the this is the main thing of what you're looking for in any vice. I don't care if it's something you've been doing for a long time or, or if you're just getting into it, uh, you, th this is a pretty big thing that you want to focus on. So let me talk a little bit about my vice. Um, I'm going to turn it here. So this is a, uh, this is a vice made by a company called Regal. Um, Regal vices, uh, are in my opinion, the best in the industry. Um, they're not cheap, uh, at all. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, you know, for instance, this setup was roughly around 600 and change. So I'm not kidding when I say they're, they're, uh, they're not price friendly, but, uh, this isn't necessarily something that I would get right off the bat when I started tying. Um, the reason why, uh, there's a lot of guys that will say, uh, invest in a good vice right away, uh, and that way you'll never have to buy another one again. Um, you know, just go for the good stuff. And I agree to a point uh, that it is good to not buy um, 
crap. Uh, and the reason why, I mean, I, anyone that knows me, uh, I like nice things. Uh, so I will not waste money on junk, but, uh, I don't really think it's an advantage for a beginning fly tire to invest $600, $700 in a vice when they don't really know what they're looking for in the vice. Uh, they don't have the experience enough to, to decide what, what is really meant for them and all the different features that they have on them and where it comes into play. You might buy a vice and find that there's nothing on there that really helps you in any way and you have all these features and you don't even use them. Uh, so, um, what, my advice to beginner tires that are looking at vice choices, um, and a lot of guys will tell you this as well is if you ever buy a fly tying kit, which is not a bad idea. Some of them are okay. Uh, hairline, uh, makes one that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and I think Cy, Cy Angler does them as well. Um, don't let anyone tell you that they're all, you know, a mistake and don't buy kits and don't, it, they're fine. Um, you're going to expand it and stuff. The one thing that is a consistent problem with it is the vice, the vice that comes in it with the price point of what kits are, they're not going to be able to fit a, uh, a vice of high quality standards in a price point of 175 or uh, $200 for all the materials and the vices. Uh, you're going to get a shitty vice. Uh, it works. Uh, and if that's all you can afford, then that's all you can afford. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you can afford it, I would really look to getting a vice separate from uh, the kits. The materials will do you fine. Um, in that case, I'm not going to grab it. It's a vice that's up top. Um, in that case, I have a more simplistic vice from, uh, uh, Apex and it is, uh, it, it was okay for when I first started tying flies. Uh, the problem that I ended up, uh, running into with a vice, is, uh, of that vice is, um, I started to find that there was problems with hook slippage, which is what I was uh, referring to in the beginning, uh, which is uh, as I was tying more and more and, and uh, I started to realize the flaws uh, in it, um, that's that's a big problem. Uh, so for 100 bucks, it got me through probably a good year and a half or two of fly tying before I migrated away. But at that point... I knew roughly what I wanted out of a vice. Um, so that's a really – that's a good jumping off point for when it's time to upgrade your vice when you could clearly answer what it is you want out of it. Um, so coming back to the Regal vice, uh, the, the main thing that I love about this vice that's very different than all the other vices out there – is uh, what they call the bulldog jaws or bite. Uh, and what it is is uh, since it's set under tension here, um, normally <coughs> when you put a hook uh, into a vise, you're going to have to uh, push a lever down and it puts pressure onto the hook and it, and it, and it clamps it like a vise would. Um, this, on the other hand, uh, the Bulldog jaws that make Regal vices unique is when I squeeze this lever, the jaws are going to open, and when I release the tension, it closes, and that bite is incredibly strong. Um, that hook is not that hook will bend in a slinky before it comes out of the vise. Uh, so, I really love that feature. That's one of the big things that I love about Regal is that I squeeze it. I set the hook in two seconds and I'm ready to go instead of adjusting uh, pressure and tension on the lever and all this other shit that I've done on the uh, the old one. Uh, it's just something I, I just don't really care to fuss with. Uh, so that's a big feature for Regal. Uh, the other thing is a lot of guys will start to talk about rotary. Uh, get a rotary vice. True rotary. Uh, as you can see... Um, my Regal Vice is a Regal Revolution. It spins materials. Uh, if I had, um, 
you know, whatever, whatever materials that is chenille, uh, wire, uh, any materials that I, I need to have multiple, uh, you know, tons of wraps with, especially if I'm doing like salmon flies or intruder flies, I could spin this thing and feed the material onto the hook as I'm doing this. And I can, uh, I could secure a lot of materials very quickly doing that. Um, disadvantage of, uh, of this is that people, <laughs> Especially the Renzetti guys, uh, people will uh, toot that uh, Regal's not uh, true rotary, um, and true rotary uh, is a little different because it keeps the hook on the same axis as the vice. What I mean by that um, is the vice arm, like this, is going to come straight. It's going to dip down into a V. It's going to come back up on the same axis as that arm. And then your hook goes into it. So as I rotate that vise, the hook is going to turn completely around without me having... You see how it pitches up? It would still be straight. And the only way I could do it on this vise is if I level my vise. And if I hook it on the back of the bend and spin it, the hook will also do this. But if I have it like this, since this is not true rotary, which is that, that V cut, um, I'm going to have to adjust my hook. So if I want a true rotary right now, I would have to turn it where this is completely level with the arm. And you see how the hook stays on the same axis? So that's that's the advantage to uh, that's the advantage to uh, true rotary vices, which... Uh, uh, some people really like uh, the big dog in the industry other than Regal uh, would be Renzetti. Uh, usually guys are one or the other. It seems to be like a little bit of a, a war between the two brands. Um, and it's not. They're both fantastic brands. I love them both. Uh, Renzetti Vices are also some of the best in the industry. They're incredibly reputable, uh, high-quality Vices and... Uh, don't let anyone tell you that one's better than the other. There, there is no one that's better than the other. Every every fly tire needs different things out of their vice. Um, it's a it really boils down to a personal preference of what works best for you. Uh, so what I prefer is not really what somebody else might prefer. But this is a video about my opinions. So uh, I love the Regal vice because that's what I got. Um, so when you're starting off tying, you're going to want to look at a, uh, a good vise that does what you need it to do. And then uh, I suggest to upgrade later when you know what you want out of it. That's super important. Um, do we have any questions about vices, what it does? What is there anything that I didn't really get into about that? If not, I'll move on to the next subject. Oh, and by the way, there's also, uh, keep in mind that when it comes to vices, they also have two styles of um, uh, sitting on your desk. So either they have a base pedestal, uh, which is something that it's, 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 a, it's a flat base and the stem comes up and then your vice goes. You could put that anywhere on the table that you want. Um, or they have a C clamp, which is a very old style. It's like this and it, and it hooks to the side of your table and, uh, you, uh, tighten it that way and it clamps onto the side of your, uh, desk or table, uh, and you tie that way. One of the reasons why I hated the C clamp, uh, to begin with was I really don't like the feeling of having my, my work dangling off the edge of a desk uh, it's just really weird. It's too close to the edge. I like to kind of, I, I like to kind of settle into my work station with something set back a little bit. 
Again, that's a personal preference, and there are guys that started uh, decades and decades ago, uh, and when you know the seat clamp was the only option really that they use most of the time, uh, some guys still prefer to this day. It really, it really uh, depends on uh, really what you started off with too. If it wasn't an option uh, and you got used to it, then it stays. Um, but since I had an option from the very beginning, I'm not a fan of the seat clamp uh, myself. I just I don't like my work hanging off the edge of the desk. Not that I feel like the fly's really going anywhere since it's in a vise, but uh, it's just kind of a, it's a perception thing for me. Uh, so moving on from vice choices, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, real quick, uh, the workstation. So the workstation, um, that I have, and I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you real quick. Um, so that's where I keep my all my thread selection for the most part my primary that's my really my palette uh and then I have my my tool caddy over there it's made by Renzetti uh I have um you know a little mat that's over here that holds beads without it rolling off your table and onto the floor uh here's your pedestal and and here's the here's my vice uh, and uh, light is super important to keep uh, your work well lit. You don't want to strain your eyes any more than you already do. Uh, that's just a bunch of hooks and materials and so on and so forth. Um, I also have all my books that are up here uh, that I've, you know, piled up over the years. Uh, uh, storage is super important because you're going to have a ton of it. So, I mean, I have storage up there. And I have a massive amount of storage cabinets down here. So there's a lot. Um, so a workstation is kind of one of those things. There's guys that will ask what the best uh, setup is for a desk or what do you guys do for your desk? Can I see pictures of, of your workstation and how do I do this? Um, your workstation is your workstation. These are... The workstation is a personal thing. It's whatever works best for you. Be creative. You're you're a fly tire. You're <laughs> you're the artist. And if you could design flies and come up with ideas doing that, I would hope that you are creative enough to come up with your own style of workstation or desk. And if not, I th sit and think about it a little bit longer. Um, uh, people in, like impulsively will will ask for help with stuff that. Really, you should be going through the process yourself. It's a, it's a very, it's a personal thing that you, and it's a growing thing when you, when you set up your work desk. I mean, this is my tying desk is something that's evolved over, over time, over years. I don't, I don't really, uh, I can't imagine somebody setting it up from the get go, and it's uh, that's the way it stays. Uh, it, it changes, it, it, you tweak it, you move stuff, you, it, it becomes whatever it becomes as you, um, as yourself, uh, develop your, your tying. Um, so, but, uh, good pointers for workstation, uh, you want to look for, uh, a lot of storage, uh, whether it's internal or external. Um, if the desk comes with a lot of storage, great. Uh, if you need to add more drawers, Go to Target, get the plastic drawers that are $10 or so. They all hold the same shit. Uh, so uh, th that that definitely is a good price point, too. I mean, you could keep adding them, and they stack. And uh, I I always suggest that. I have a bunch of them, uh, like I just showed you, and they're from Target. They're nothing special, but they have plenty of storage room, and they hold all my stuff, and that's all I really want. Uh, Hobby Lobby is also another good place to, uh, to find, um, storage. Uh, so any questions about workstation? Anything about your fly tying desk? What, what anything that you don't really know about? Ooh, nine views. Keep it up. Ooh, 10. <laughs> Hello, everyone. 11. There you go. Uh, so, uh, so moving on from storage of your fly tying desk, uh, I'm going to get into uh, hooks. Um, so when you're starting off fly tying uh, and you're deciding what hooks to buy, 
Uh, first, you need to make a decision as to what kind of flies you are planning to fish. Uh, so yesterday I got into a little touch of what it means to um, uh, have dry flies, nymphs, and streamers. I'm going to get into that a little bit more with hook selection. Um, so when it comes to hook selection and when, you, when you're figuring this out, when you're uh, beginning fly tying, Really what you want to decide is, are you going to be fishing dry flies? Are you going to be fishing nymphs or are you going to be fishing streamers, which is kind of odd for someone to just get into. So let me, let me go over that real quick. So dry flies are the flies that float on top of the water. Um, nymphs are going to be flies that go under the surface and, and under the water. Uh, and then streamers are flies that are not really flies at all. They're not imitating insects or anything like that. They imitate bait fish and uh, any sort of aquatic life that's found under the water, like crayfish or uh, sculpin or anything like that. They're big. So in the beginning, when you first start uh, fly fishing and fly tying, uh, you really, the primary two things that are really is a big decision for me is, am I going to be tying dry flies or am I going to be tying nymphs? Um, or maybe a little bit of both. So if you're tying dry flies, which are the ones that float on top, dry flies are going to be a dry fly hook. Uh, the things that make a dry fly hook a dry fly hook is the weight of the hook. Uh, they are a lighter metal meant to not weigh down flies. 36 people watching. That's awesome. Hello, everybody. Um, so dry fly hooks are, are a lighter metal. Uh, and they are a uh, different shape. Uh, they have a downward eye. They have a straight shank. Um, and they are, the, the nymph shapes are a little bit different. And depending on the brand, that can vary widely. Uh, so really make a, a decision with that and uh, figure out what you're doing. If you are beginning, I would probably suggest to try the nymphing first. Uh, trout feed under the water more than they do rise on top. And if you're beginning, I highly doubt that fly, uh, dry flies are going to give you the fish that you're really looking for. Uh, you're there to catch fish. Uh, do the nymphs first, really. Um, and, and, you know, maybe 20 years later, you'll be the, you know, the, the dry fly snob. Um, <laughs> so... The hook decision is is a very it's a very large selection of shit out there that you look to. Uh, there's a bunch of different brands. It could be overwhelming. You don't really know what the hell to pick. Uh, so if you're starting off and you want to get your uh, lineup of hooks that are going to get you through a pretty good amount of stuff, uh, if you are going to get dry fly hooks, uh, I would get them in uh, a few sizes, uh, maybe a size 12, 14 uh, 16 and 18, uh, just to start off, uh, and each box will cost you maybe seven, eight dollars or something like that. Uh, so I would start off with, with, uh, that. Now, if you're going for nymphs, uh, there are a lot of style of nymph hooks out there. Certain bodies, um, require different shapes to the hooks. Uh, and that, again, it depends on the brand. There's a shit ton of style hooks out there. It's kind of like a canvas for a painter. Uh, some people prefer linen. Some people prefer can, uh, cotton duck. Uh, it, it's still a personal uh, choice as to what really works best for you. Um, so when it comes to uh, nymph hooks, now I'm going to show you what I use primarily. Uh, is a brand called Firehole Outdoors. Uh, Firehole is a little bit newer on the scene in the fly fishing industry. Um, they're based out of Montana. Uh, the owner is Joe Mathis. He's a is a really really amazing guy. Um, he it's a family owned business. Uh, he pumps these out from home. Uh, they are absolutely in my personal opinion, the best hooks I've ever tied on for a lot of reasons. The hook shapes that they have are incredibly unique to Firehole. Uh, I believe there's a few that are actually being patented for their uh, hook shape design. Uh, so Firehole Outdoors is, is the hooks that I have uh, migrated to uh, almost exclusively uh, after a few years of tying. 
Uh, I started off on Dairikis. They're not really, not that I'm out here to really say anything, um, not to really say anything bad about brands. Uh, Dairiki is a lower cost brand. Um, they're made in Korea. They did okay for the very beginning, but uh, I found that there was a lot of problems with breakage uh, on them. They tend to be a little bit more brittle. Uh, I also heard rumors that they're not even in production anymore. Uh, so, Dairikis did uh, well for what it was worth. Um, and there's all, they, you also have Umqua, which also makes great hooks too. Uh, so, for Firehole, uh, my hook selection I boiled down to a certain few that I really, really like to use. Uh, and I keep them, if you're looking to store them all, I keep them in a storage box like this, uh, they're all, I don't want to pitch it too much because they, they jump compartments. Um, but I label them this way and I'll keep all the hooks, uh, size from the biggest down to the smallest and another style. I'll also keep that way, uh, biggest to the smallest. Everything is organized and ready to go. And, uh, for fire hole, I recommend if you're doing your overall nymph hooks, uh, that kind of uh, cover most grounds is the Firehole 315s. Uh, they are a nymph stone clink hammer style hook. Uh, they have a really beautiful bend to them. Uh, and those hooks will do most nymphs uh, for a long time if you're starting off. So Firehole 315s, I would get a 14 up to like a size 20 to start. And you're going to find that most patterns you could tie on uh, on the 315s. Uh, the other one that I like to use that has an extended length of shank, when I say that, that means that I am looking at, and I'm going to show you this, uh, I am looking at particularly the section on the hook that's not the eye, and it's not the bend, it's in between, it's this, it's the spine of the hook right here, that's your, that's your shank, so when it says... Um, so when it says extended length, that means that if there was a standard, it has a longer length and it will tell you how much longer it is to the standard than usual. Um, so Firehole 718s are what I use for a longer body. If you're looking to tie stone flies, things like that, I would get a, um, Firehole 718. Um, those really, those two are, are pretty good to, to, to get you going. And if you need dry fly hooks, uh, I like the Firehole 419s for dry fly hooks. Um, they have a super wide gap. What do I mean by gap? Your hook gap is going to be the space from your shank to the point. It's this in between right here of the curve. That's your gap. So fire hole is unique in the fact that their hook gap is very wide. Uh, and the advantage of having a wide hook gap is that when it sets into the trout's mouth, uh, it's going to have a wider surface area to latch onto the, the, uh, the skin of the trout's mouth. Uh, if, if, the, if the hook gap is really small, uh, if there's any materials that are built up above it, uh, it might miss that hook set. Uh, so you're really, the, the wide gap hooks are becoming increasingly popular for a lot of reasons. And, uh, a big reason is because it will hook fish a lot better. Um, Chris, yeah, definitely try those hooks. Firehole is amazing. I, I cannot stress that enough. They're sharp as shit. Uh, they are, uh, strong as, as hell. They, they are beautiful looking hooks. Uh, really try them. Uh, and I don't work for Firehole. I'm, this is just, I'm really into them. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, their beads too. Their beads are also fantastic. So if you're looking for hooks, um, this brings me to my next, uh, kind of a sub subject of hooks is, um, fishing barbless. This is, this is an interesting, uh, subject. So another Another really good um, feature that is in firehole hooks, and there are other hook companies that there are other hook companies that do uh, barbless hooks. Um, but firehole is one of those that has <laughs> the quality, uh, the wide hook gap, 
uh, and also uh, there's no barb on them. So initially, when I first um, got introduced to the theory of fishing barbless hooks, and there's a lot of pressure uh, to fish barbless uh, for reasons I will get into, um, is if you are a fly fisherman, most likely you are into the conservation aspect of it. Maybe not, but a lot of guys are. And the most important thing about barbless hooks is to reduce the damage done to the trout's mouth. Um, now, when they first talk about this stuff, a lot of guys are resistant to that because they go, uh, barbless, well, you know, fuck that. I, I'm not losing fish over that bullshit. I mean, I, I care about the fish and all, but fuck that. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to lose fish over not having a barb. I'm, they're going to be sliding off left and right. It is so not true. I, I can't stress this enough. It's not true. Uh, it's actually the complete opposite. They hook more fish and you land more fish. And I'm going to get into why. <laughs> so when you have a hook that has a barb in it, and again, for you guys that don't really know much about hooks or, or, or uh, kind of new to all of this stuff, when the hook shank goes and you have the, the curve and then you have your primary point, did you ever notice that on hooks you have that, that, that hook point that's going the opposite way? That's the barb. Um, it's, it's meant to catch into stuff and not be able to easily be backed out. Um, that's the design of it. Uh, if you ever got one in your finger, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a bitch to get out. It hurts. Uh, I can imagine what it does to the fish. You could see what it does to the fish when you try to pull it out, even with forceps. What the hell are forceps? Pliers. F hemostats. You know, it, it's, they're, they're pliers. A lot of guys use these to get the hook out of the fish's mouth. Even when you have barbless, you do, and I'll get into that. Um, but it tears up the fish's mouth, and the fish have been proven to have a higher mortality rate getting returned to the water, even if you handled them very well, if they are injured like that. They are weak in the water. They're injured prey. That doesn't go well in the animal kingdom. So... When we are fishing barbless hooks, it's reducing the damage done to the fish's mouth so that we can return them back to the water uh, so that they can go back to their little trout family uh, and we might be able to visit them next Monday. Um, if you don't do that uh, and you think that you're doing everyone a favor by following all the other steps but you're fishing with barbs, uh, I hate to break it to you, but a lot of times if you fuck up a fish's mouth like that, um, it, it, it's probably, it, it can die because it's an injured fish in water that has predators and it just doesn't work out well in the animal kingdom to be injured and to be around other animals. Um, so that, that is the reason why, uh, it, it, that is a primary reason why you use barbless hooks. It's for conservation purposes. If you value the places that you fish, if you love the fish that you catch, do it a favor and let it go. Get your picture. That's what you want. And let them go home. It's what they want. So both of you guys will be happy. And for you guys that choose to harvest trout, that's fine too. As long as you adhere to your state's rules and regulations, that's a personal choice too. I myself am a catch and release guy. So I don't keep anything. And um, that's, that's why I use barbless hooks. So let me get into the barbless hooks a little bit more with another part. So, um, so about losing fish, which is a lot of guys' primary concern. Uh, there, I know that my initial gut feeling was I'm going to lose fish if I fish barbless hooks. Uh, they're going to slide right off the fucking thing, um, and you're nervous to switch over to it, even though deep down inside you know that it's probably better for the fish. You're selfish to the point where you you still don't want to lose the fish. So you're, you're hesitant about it and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a really strange, it's a really strange feeling to have because you're, you're kind of combating two different feelings there. Um, but there's a reason why barbless hooks, uh, land you more fish. And this is what I'm going to get into. So 
on the hook. Um, imagine the hook bend going around, and here's the point. And as it pierces through the fish's skin, or imagine any object that's constructed this way, that pierces through um, a material, the hook is going to penetrate through the hooks uh, through the fish's uh, skin, uh, and because there's a point of resistance on the hook, which is the barb, it most likely is going to slow down and stop. Now, this is a, a millisecond that this happens, but when you set the hook and you pull back, and that that hook jams back into their into their lips, the the force of that penetration that the piercing of the point it slows down when there's a point of resistance the barb is going to cause the hook to slow down and stop most likely at the barb so and i know this from firsthand looking at them when i would take out my hooks when they did have barbs in them 90 percent of the time the barb was right at the precipice of the the puncture hole that's where it kind of got stuck but it was never really deeper than that. Um, now, to contrast that, a barbless hook will pierce through the skin and will continually go through that skin and out the other side or deeper in, and it causes a deeper hook set. The hook goes in much deeper. So when it's deep into the fish's lip, or wherever it may be, hopefully your reaction time is good enough where you're not making the trout swallow the fucking thing. And and if and if you are, get better at setting that hook sooner. Don't don't be that guy. Um, so set the hook quick. Uh, and when it gets most likely into their lip area, it's gonna pierce deeper. When the barbless hooks pierce deeper into the trout's mouth, the fish does not just slide off of the hook immediately because there's no barb there as long as you keep pressure on the fish the fish is not going to come off and again i have used forceps again it's these guys pliers to help me get the hook out of the fish's mouth even when it's barbless because that's how deep the hook goes in now the great thing about it is when you go to take it out it slides right out so when that happens, the fish have what anyone would have with a piercing. It's a, it's a small little puncture hole. It's not getting torn the fuck up with a barb. So I have 120% uh, caught and landed more fish when I switched to barbless than I did when I had a barb. Um, so do yourself a favor. Really consider going barbless if you haven't already. And if you have hooks that have barbs, you mash them down. And you could use your forceps, the same forceps that you use to unjam the, the hook out of the fish's mouth. Uh, you could also use that to get on top of the barb on your hook. And before you start tying on it, mash the barb down. And you squeeze it until you don't see any lump on top and you know that it's down. You could use it. Um, fire hole hooks have, have a, uh, very distinct curvature to their, to their barbless hooks. It's the wide gap and the, the hook point turns up like an octopus hook. Uh, and that design feature, uh, makes it a superior barbless hook because of its shape and design. Uh, not to say that you can't pinch down a barb on an older style hook, um, and the older style hooks tend to be a little bit more straight. They don't curve up towards the shank. Um, they still work, uh, but the, that style in particular, uh, it really gives you an advantage because it's a very unique shape to it. Um, and, uh, to follow that up, uh, turn that concept to yourself, uh, barbless hooks are safe for the fish and you. If you're fishing and lord knows we've all done it we've hooked ourselves in the fucking hands we've hooked ourselves in our ass our leg or wh whatever it may be especially in the beginning when you first start i mean your shit's all over the place my god um you are most likely going to get hooked somewhere at some point sometime 
Um, if you get hooked with a barbed hook, uh, it's going to hurt a lot, and it's going to hurt a lot more coming out than probably it was going in. Uh, fishing barbless hooks are an advantage to the fishermen as well. It allows them to get a hook out. God forbid it ever went into a section like your face uh, or, or anything like that. Um, it, or God, I don't even want to imagine it, your eye. Um, that is going to cause irreversible damage in some instances. If it's a barbless hook, it's a piercing, uh, which absolutely would heal completely differently. So for uh, beginner guys out there that are debating, you know, about the barbed or the barbless, uh, do yourself a favor if it's not for the trout um, and fish barbless for, for, for you if you want to just do it for yourself. It's safer for you and for anyone that's around you. I mean, I know that there's guys out there with kids um, and women out there with kids and you take them fishing. Uh, I don't really think that that's something you would want. I have, I have a little one too. Uh, I really wouldn't want uh, anything to happen. You know how they are. The kids creep up around you when you don't know where the fuck they are. They they you, they disappear in a second. So uh, they could be behind you when you're when you're casting, trying to show them something, and you wouldn't even know until the hook is is somewhere in them. So uh, really, it's it's for the safety of you, everyone around you, and the fish. Uh, so barbless hooks are are in my opinion the way to go. Uh, does anybody have any questions about fishing barbless? Uh, that's right, Chris. Barbless all the way, man. Um, is there anyone that has questions about fishing barbless that I didn't get into? Are there any hesitations on stuff? Is there any questions about catch and release or conservation that you guys have that you don't really know about that I haven't gotten into? You could feel free to ask any question you want and, uh... Any question is a good question. The only dumb question is the one unasked. So uh, if you have any questions about fishing barbless or catch and release practices, uh, ask away. And I'll give you a moment to think. There's a, there's a lot of steps to releasing a fish and not having them die. So if you want me to get into that, let me know if not, if you want me to stop I'll stop so maybe I'll save that for another one um, but barbless barbless hooks are uh, barbless hooks are absolutely superior in every way they'll they'll land you more fish I promise just trust me on it it'll get you more fish um, are there any other questions? about anything before I finish off this video for the night. Because I'm going to save other subjects for, for other nights. I don't want to lump it all together. And thank you guys for... Thank you for joining. I see I have 15, 16 people, which is... It was up to 30-something, which is pretty amazing. That's, that's really cool. Um... Anyone have any questions um, before I just do my next one tomorrow? So I went over vice choice and workstation. I went over hooks and hook styles. And I went over the practice of fishing barbless. How soon would you recommend releasing a fish? That's a really good question. Uh, so... I. Uh, there's a saying in the fly fishing industry and world uh, that is keep them wet uh, as soon as possible, uh, Michelle. You want to release them as soon as possible. The more handling that you have on the fish, the less chances they are to survive. Uh, when I say keep them wet, that means that before touching the fish, you're going to wet your hands first. And I know instinctually you're going to go, well, fuck that. You're going to get your hands all wet and then you go to grab the fish and it's going to slide right out of your hand and rock it into the river never to be seen again. And uh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> doesn't work like that either. Uh, yes, the fish have a slime coating, a protective coating on their bodies uh, that uh, help with uh, prevent disease and everything else in the water. Um, but it is important to wet your hands before handling the fish because if you don't, the slime is going to stick to your skin and come right off the fish. 
Uh, so when you put them back in the water, they lost their slime coat and that opens them up to bacteria and diseases. And that's also another way of killing them. So, uh, you do want to keep your hands wet when you handle them. And, uh, when do you want to release them as soon as possible? Uh, try to keep them wet through most of the, uh, the, the process of landing them. Land them as quick as you can without fucking up your your <laughs> your your uh, your catch. So uh, don't don't play around with the fish forever. Get them in at the time that's appropriate to get them into the net. When they get in the net, if you're not ready to take your photo or to oogle it, um, then let the fish stay in the net until you are ready to do so. If you can't do it, uh, have someone else hold the net for you until you're ready to handle the fish. Put the net handle between your legs if you have to and keep the fish in the water and wet and breathing. Remember, when they're out of the water, they're not breathing anymore. They're struggling. So really what you need to do is is keep them in the water as long as you can. When you do want to take a picture, you get your hands wet first. You reach under their belly very gently. Uh, let them get their little... You know, they'll, they'll shake and they'll do their, they'll do their thing. And then when the fish calms down and it settles, you have a moment or so to lift it out of the net before he twitches again. So, and sometimes they will get the best of you and they'll flop right out of your hand and back into the water. Chris, I'll answer your question in one sec. Um, they will jump out of your hand and they'll go back in the water and you never got a chance to take a photo of them. I hate to break it to you. That's the name of the game. Every once in a while, it happens in the beginning. It happens a lot because you're not really quite sure of the timing of how to hold them out of the water. And, and certain spots that you touch on them will also cause them to twitch more because they don't feel safe. Uh, so the best way to do it is to cradle under their stomach with their, uh, with their side fins in front of your hand uh, up here. And just let their belly uh, stay on your stomach. Uh, so you lift up. You take your photo back in the water. If you didn't get a good one, you can lift out again, click, and then back down into the water again. Uh, and then when you're ready to say goodbye and, and you're done enjoying your moment, uh, let it go. <laughs> and um, that's how long I would recommend releasing a fish as soon as possible, uh, you know, after you're done getting your, your oogling eyes off of them. Uh, so, Chris, can you recommend... The firehole models again. I tie a lot of caddis and clink dries. You're up in Maine. Nice. You guys got brookies like I couldn't imagine. Lucky. Uh, so firehole models. Um, so for caddis and clinks, yeah. Um, so for caddis and clink uh, bugs, I would do. Uh, so the firehole three fifteens. Uh, which is uh, nymph stone clink. Uh, that covers pretty much all grounds when it comes to that stuff, Chris. So I would recommend Firehole 315s for, uh, for clink hammers. If you go on Firehole Outdoors website and look at their hook styles, they also have another hook style that's very, very, very clink hammer style. Uh, and it, it's also really nice. There's a slight difference in the design of them, but... Firehole 315s have never let me down when it comes to that. You really don't need every single model under the sun to do what you need to do. 315s. Uh, and for for Caddis too, it will do the same thing. It's a straight eye too and heavy. Uh, so uh, when it comes to dries... Okay, so when it comes to dry fly hooks... Uh, and Chris, I'm sorry, the, the Firehole 718s is the one with the, with the extended shank length. So you're gonna if you wanna if you wanna have those two if you wanna remember what I said earlier, Firehole Seven Eighteens is gonna take care of that extra length for you if you wanna do uh, stones and stuff like that. Um, and then your dry fly hooks, I'll come back to it. Uh, these are going to be your Firehole Four Nineteens. Um, they're two X. Uh, they're light. I'll show them to you. Uh, these are awesome and whatever size you want, he's got them all. Uh, Joe Car Joe has, uh, an amazing inventory of stuff. Uh, so, um, for dry fly hooks, the 419s are where it's at. And, uh, they, they do have, all of them have that extra wide hook gap and that unique curvature to them. Uh, so you'll find that in all of the firehole outdoor hooks, not just, uh, the nymphs. 
Uh, Craig, what's up? Good to see you. Tell Monica I said hi. Jim, hello. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of faces on here. I'm sorry I didn't say hi earlier. Nat, hi. Good to see you. For everyone that's watching out there, I really appreciate it. If you have any other questions before I sign off for tonight, uh, you could ask away. Don't feel weird. Um, uh, I'll answer whatever questions you got about it, about fishing in general. You could ask anything you want if you're kind of in the dark about stuff. Thank you, Chris. I'll be doing it again tomorrow. I'll be doing uh, another subject. I'll slowly pick them away. So thanks for viewing. I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And guys, for all of you that are watching that uh, want to see, uh, I'm going to be doing videos pretty much every night. Um, so you could subscribe to it as well. That three dot thing up on the top right. Uh, if you turn on notifications for the live videos, I will pop up on your thing. Um, Ryan, what is a good starter fly to try? It depends. Are you going dry flies or nymphs? Uh, so remember, like I said, dry flies are the guys that float on top of the water and nymphs are the ones that go down into the water. So to answer that question, I, I would probably need to know more than one or the other. I would say uh, what I first started tying, uh, my first fly that I ever tied was a Griffith's gnat. I don't really think that came in handy for me in the very beginning. Uh, as a fly tire, yes. As a fly fisherman, no. Um, a good starter fly to try. So I would have to say that if it's, if it's a dry fly that you want to start off with to try to tie, I would say a Griffith's gnat to tie. Um, if it's a nymph and you're tying it, probably a zebra midge, uh, that just requires a bead, black thread and silver wire. It's as simple as it gets. Uh, that's also a good f nymph to start tying. Um, uh, if you're talking about fishing, a good starter fly to fish. Uh, I would probably recommend if you're doing dry flies in the very early beginning and you want a good general dry fly that'll pretty much cover a lot of grounds, an Adams, an Adams parachute, uh, a Royal Wolf. It's a very classic old pattern. I'll show it to you. I actually have one tied right here. Um, it's got that red belt around the body of it. Uh, it's buggy as fuck. Um, this is an attractor pattern. It doesn't really imitate anything particularly, but this will nail fish on the rise. Um, and that, that is a very, I find it's a very important fly to have in the beginning, uh, Royal Wolf's kill. Um, otherwise I would probably recommend an Adams or an Adams parachute, uh, to have as a, as a good starter fly to, to dry fly, uh, fish, uh, to start, Nymphing, uh, again, that's the bugs that go under the water. Uh, if you want to start fly fishing and you choose to do nymphing, a really good um, starter fly that's going to catch you fish, as generic as it sounds, a pheasant tail nymph. Uh, pheasant tail, what the hell is that? Pheasant tail is this stuff. It's a tail of a pheasant. Um, that is a pretty good overall pattern and there's a lot of variations to pheasant tails. Um, but that will definitely, that'll definitely catch a fish. Um, you know, anything like that. Uh, I also like to do anything with a hot spot collar. So if you do a pheasant tail nymph, Ryan, um, you might want to change something about it, something to entice the trout. So if you want to learn, like if it's the only nymph that you're tying right now, because that's all you know how to do, um, I would just get practice tying a pheasant tail nymph, which there's videos of that, uh, and then just tweak certain things about it. So you could use like hot spot threads, um, and chain wrap it around the collar behind the bead and you'll have your variations that way. Um, and you could nail a ton of fish just on that fly. Just change some shit about it. And, um, uh, 
and you'll be good to go. And and I that that's a good starter nymph uh, to 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 fish. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Ryan. Uh, 20 views. All right. Is there any other questions that you guys have out there before I sign off? Get them in. Anything that you're totally oblivious about. You have no idea anything about it, but you're curious. Don't feel bad to ask a question that might sound stupid because it's not. Ask anything. Um, I'll, I'll answer it. Anything about fishing, tying, fish. All right, otherwise I'm going to end it here before I go off on another tangent of subjects. It's pretty easy to do. I would talk to a wall if it would listen. Um, thanks again, guys, for uh, for joining. Uh, Ryan, th thanks, thanks for joining. Um, I will be back tomorrow night. I already have a list of subjects that I'm going through. So uh, feel free to tune in. Uh, cheers. I hope everybody's doing all right. Hunkered down. It sucks, um, but it it will it will end. Uh, did that piercing? Did that piercing hurt? Uh, I guess you're talking about my nose, not my my ears or my nose. I guess my nose. Uh, yeah, of course it did. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Don't let anyone tell you it doesn't. Of course it does. Is it something that you get through? Yeah, you'll you'll live. <laughs> does it hurt? Yeah. <laughs> it feels like someone punched you in the face, but uh, it, it it's a very fleeting feeling. It goes away pretty pretty quick. Uh, I've had this for a long time, so, um, and for the ears too, did that hurt? Yeah, sometimes, uh, a lot, um, all right, so I hope everyone's doing all right out there, everything's gonna be all right, uh, just, you know, keep a word of advice, uh, with everything that's going on is, number one, uh, stay calm, and, uh, don't let the headlines scare you, um, more than, more than you need to be. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that's that's scaring people and not to say that it's not a very serious thing that's going on right now uh, It's scary shit, but uh, at the same time we'll be okay. It will pass and um, And don't let those headlines sensationalize anything because that's exactly what it's doing It actually ensues more panic and more fear, which is not what we need right now We need to stick together and we need to stay calm and we need to just remember that it will go away um, saying that the hospitals are falling apart and that the, you know, it, it just, we don't need to hear that shit. Um, so don't buy into the shit that's spread on social media. Stick to the facts, listen to the news in the morning when you need to, and call it a day. Um, seriously, it's not good for you. And try not to, try not to spread, you know, news articles on, on, you know, sensationalized bullshit. We're better than that, right? So... Cheers. I got myself some Jameson in here. Hopefully you guys are, you know, having a drink to calm yourselves down and relax. Uh, and we're all in this together and we'll all be okay together. Uh, so join me tomorrow night. Again, this is Scott Fisher uh, for with Fisher Flyworks, which is my company. Uh, it's on Etsy, Fisher Flyworks. Um, and you could also follow my page, Fisher Flyworks, which is also on Facebook. I'm going to move this video over to there when I'm done. All right, so thank you very much, guys. Cheers, have a good night, and see you tomorrow night. Later.